my lab had received millions of dollars. And they, this is tax money. This is people's money. And somehow, in our academic mission of obviously preserving the knowledge base of humanity, this is why we become professors, we are the palace guards basically, and then to transmit it to the students teaching and to keep research, there is also an element which is called service to society with your knowledge, with your discoveries, whatever you have come up with. And if you have the character and you have the resilience and the commitment that you can do it. So this is this corresponds at the time when I was creating this school, which is totally interdisciplinary school, a school of biomedical engineering science and health systems. And that school was supposed to uh, truly act on this new revelation that I had. And I had several colleagues who were um, courageous enough to join me. So we created this university level faculty and welcomed into it not only uh, well, life scientists, uh, um, uh, obviously um, um, the um, um, uh, positive sciences, but also engineers and even uh, disciplines that are more on to the uh, um, business side of the thing. So um, colleagues from not only design, but also economics and so on and so forth. So while that school was happening, I was literally putting myself through a, um, through a test. Was I going to be able to show the way, by example, to all those whom I was recruiting for this school? So I did not realize at the time that the path was so long for the, the, in our case, patient, or the, um, uh, the, it could be a healthy person, also it could be a pilot who is going to command now this very uh, complex uh, mission, uh, uh, for instance, that the, this person's uh, brain and body should be part of the technology, which in a, is an area where we work also in addition to health solutions. But what I realized by just literally injecting myself into various courses in the business school or various activities, economic development activities, so on and so forth in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is very well endowed because Philadelphia, if you are not familiar, was a place where the American industry uh, arose. This is where the, it was not only the birthplace of the United States of America, but also the industry. And because the city, uh, Philadelphia, is I will return to this, by the way, and maybe I, before I go to that, I should mention that soon enough I realized by putting myself through the test uh, and putting myself into various experiences that the university truly doesn't belong in this path. It can only be a place where you can get things started. So, because everything is, we will see, I will do a risk analysis of all of that. Risks are extraordinary commercial risks are extraordinary at the university because tomorrow I will come up with a new idea, I have brilliant students and I will go to them and say, let's work on this. And you, I will never study if there's commercial viability, marketability, nothing like that. And this is why we need to keep our university so open-ended, so discovery-based, in order for us to come up, as a uh, few of us were talking, and because uh, Professor Tennant said, you have to go crazy. In order to go crazy, you need open structures. You, you should be allowed to engage in any strange ideas that you have. But that is also, this comes with a humongous commercial risk, of course. So let's continue. And uh, probably, uh, I think uh, one of my colleagues asked, what is this H.H. Sun professor? That's him. This is uh, Hun Sun, but we, uh, in US we call um, uh, professor, he's one of the pioneers of biomedical engineering, actually, and he's the founder of this, one of the first institutes. I am the graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, where uh, um, the first bioengineering uh, um, uh, uh, department was founded, and I happened to be there uh, studying medical electronics, and my advisor actually was the founder, and it became the first bioengineering uh, department. But this, beca uh, this became the first bioengineering institute and uh, uh, when I joined after graduating, uh, actually, no, um, uh, 
September 1st, 1980, I returned to, uh, to, uh, to Istanbul, Turkey, to work at my alma mater, uh, Boğaziçi University. But you know what happened soon after. And then in uh, May 1st, 1981, I'm already back in Philadelphia. So that story is very interesting also. But in any case, what I do when I go to back to Philadelphia, where I had studied, I had known him obviously because he's such an amazing uh, pioneer, as was my advisor, who basically is the founder of bioengineering and the founder of the first bioengineering program. So eventually, uh, I basically took, carried the legacy, and we transformed that institute, that first issue, 60 years old institute 20 years ago into the school. This is the school I was telling you about, a school dedicated to life-saving solutions that would create educational experiences while we were working on these solutions. Hence, we would move discoveries from the laboratory to a healthcare region, <coughs> and we partnered with our region, and we eventually became a national practice, a national best practice, actually, and that is why uh, I will be able to tell you from experience all the various learnings and, uh, and other, uh, other than learning, oftentimes I should say, humiliate, humiliating experiences uh, um, for faculty. The ego is a very strong uh, element of our personality. And to learn uh, how to accept uh, failure is very, very difficult. But when uh, ideas are moving into practice, oftentimes academic thinking is going to produce very erroneous uh, concepts and very erroneous understanding of things. So I had to learn to, um, to uh, basically control my ego, tame my ego, basically. And this, this the, the school eventually became a national best practice. Partially, it became also very successful as this independent institute hybrid academic unit because it did not uh, fragment itself into departments. Instead, this is a, uh, what we will call in Turkey faculty. Uh, uh, and we did not create departments. What we created are moving frontiers. It was bioinformatics. Right now, it's personalized bioengineering. Neuroengineering has become cognitive neuroengineering. Tissue engineering has become regenerative bioengineering. And of course, you have to have core competences, especially uh, you have to have uh, strong foundations. In our case, it was bioimaging, biosensing, biomechanics, and for this, this is our core competence. And on top of it, we have developed the enabling uh, technology uh, know-how in bio nanotechnology. Biomedical ultrasound is our brand, basically, because biomedical ultrasound imaging was invented at Drexel University, but to that we added biomedical optics. So the life starts in very interesting uh, uh, fashion. And you happen to look around you. For instance, Ankara is a very amazing place. When I first very actively on the grounds started working in Ankara, it became very uh, obvious, especially when we organized Inovankara. Maybe we should go back to it, actually. Inovankara brought all the stakeholders that would bring uh, uh, de novo um, um, health technologies uh, or existing technologies, new generations, uh, um, uh, to Ankara, it was very uh, obvious to me that because of the strong defense industry and the know-how that we have in defense industry in Ankara would translate very rapidly into health solutions. Actually, there has been several attempts to bring these two sectors together and make sure that Ankara becomes an innovation center in health uh, technologies. Well, we did not quite succeed, but you should always look. Uh, we will hopefully restart, hopefully. Uh, and we, I all know that there are some colleagues from also uh, science, technology, and industry ministry. Of course, we've been working with them very closely. We've been working with, uh, with uh, the uh, Ministry of Economy, in, in, uh, Ministry of, um, uh, of, um, um, uh, of Defense. Uh, actually, we call it SESEME, Savunma Sanayi Müsteşarlığı, and their R&D teams. Uh, also, we have worked, uh, because you have to go where the critical masses of those who are capable of pushing frontiers exist, and we have worked also with the military, the R&D uh, groups 
that they have. In any case, Philadelphia, we, so we had to look around us in order to see where the resources are, truly well endowed place because this is where United States industry was created, but also because it's a Quaker city, for those of you who may not know what Quakerism is. Quakerism is a branch of Christianity which does not have a structural um, um, sort of um, nature. It is totally, depend, uh, totally uh, focused on education, humanity, and they are pacifists. Uh, they do not believe in wars, so that's why Philadelphia never uh, accepted military industries like Boston or San Francisco did. Instead, went directly into healthcare, so it's what we call an education and healthcare, so we are an EdMed city. It's an education and medicine city. And we are, obviously, uh, we are also the center of pharmaceuticals, biopharmaceutical, biotechnology, and also systems integration, especially for civilian applications. So there are many, many resources in your region, and you have to be very clear when you have a mission to accomplish. And Ankara is, is a place I know quite well, likewise Istanbul, but I also know various centers in, uh, in Anatolia where there is great capacity to push uh, the new generation uh, life science solution. For those of you um, who are uh, Turks here, one of the uh, very sad statistics that we have at this moment is that we are currently 90%, it used to be 85%, now 90% dependent on all the uh, uh, pharmaceutical and medical technologies. So imagine a situation where Turkey will not be allowed to import the medicines, import medical devices. What will happen to us? So this has been for us for the last 10, 15 years, a mission for Turkey for the uh, security and also for the viability and the welfare of the country. So uh, it's, uh, it, it is a time when we truly need to understand what we needed to do in order to bring whatever it takes. And the brain power is not only contained in this country, many of our uh, students and, uh, uh, and researchers are outside in the world, all over the world right now. It used to be that it was only Europe or it was uh, North America. It is now also in South Asia. Now I see them more in South Korea, in Japan, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, all of them. So we have an amazing brain power that we can bring to bear and we can totally organize. And that was what Innovankara was, what Innovist for Istanbul. That continued in wonderful ways. Today is not the point, but if you're interested, those of you who are interested in this kind of stuff, uh, I can give you some information. Let me, let me just proceed. But your region, where you come from, who you meet, who you come together, and who, like in my case, I carry the legacy of Professor Sun, because when I came to Drexel University as a pioneer in biomedical engineering, he pretty much took me under his wings, and together we evolved, actually, the topic we were working on, which is, in my case, signal systems, especially from the complex point of view, and also signal processing, the uh, ability to process information in very noisy and uh, very corrupt environments. Another person in our region, uh, a world, uh, a singular person, a world giant, basically, uh, the fact that he didn't get Nobel Prizes because perhaps he died too soon, is Britain Chance. Those of you who are in Optophotonics would know him for sure, uh, but also he's the inventor of uh, um, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, as well as during the Second World War, uh, he worked on the radar. He, he, he was in the team that designed the radars that pretty much gave the, um, the Second World War to the Allies. Uh, he came up with this idea one day when the, um, the um, technology was working on at the time uh, related to the magnetic resonance imaging was uh, not functioning properly. So he said, why don't I use light? And he uses light, he shines light into his head and starts collecting information. And what happens afterwards is a very, very interesting story. So we took this technology and I will show the evolution of the technology. We, our students and us, 
uh, we welcomed them into our campus. Our two campuses are very uh, close by. It's pretty much the same university campus. And we basically absorbed his uh, knowledge. And because we're good engineers, we translated into a technology that DARPA, the uh, Defense uh, uh, Advanced Research uh, Program Agency, discovered the work that we were doing. We were using it for babies. We were using it for medical applications. They discovered us because in 2001, they came up with this very amazing program called Augmented Cognition Program. And they were scouting talent. And they came to our labs. And what happened afterwards is quite interesting. And when I show you the technology, you will appreciate. But this was a man who, for 35 years, was not only the founder, but also the person who made Office of Naval Research what it was. And, uh, and then also the team that he came with uh, truly became part of us. So that, that is, uh, I will eventually tie this to the whole picture. Uh, what this program was, that National uh, Academy of Sciences had um, uh, uh, divined, basically, apply computational power to support augmented cognitive uh, skills bolstering limited weight. What it says is, use natural intelligence augmented by artificial intelligence in a technology loop. This is what became pretty much the, uh, uh, the direction of our life from this moment. But we always kept our commitment to healthcare solutions. And you will see two innovations that I will uh, speak about are uh, in healthcare. But in any case, this is not only for warfare or for uh, operational aviation uh, uh, or um, other topics or automotive. It is also for healthcare. So immediately when they scouted the talent, they were very ready to uh, invest in, in us. And this is what I would very much like to see that Tubitak also does. Because we have, and because I'm a scouter also, in, uh, in, in Anatolia, when I travel, I find such amazing talent. But they stay local, and they don't become part of that amazing network that we should be creating within the country and outside the country to be able to not only uh, uh, seize the moment, but also advance the frontiers that others are not advancing or join forces with them. But in any case, so they are with us. They descend into the site. This is our lab. And this is what techno this technology, the first uh, incarnations of this technology. Uh, all the major companies get to be introduced uh, to us. We become part of an amazing network of universities, uh, uh, various companies, Microsoft, Intel, um, uh, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, uh, all of them. So this is a, uh, this is a moment. Again, in history, when we are at Microsoft, because we are constantly coming together, and because we have a mission to uh, develop the uh, solutions for augmenting cognition, meaning fusing natural and, uh, uh, and, uh, and artificial intelligence. But in any case, at the time, we were not speaking artificial intelligence that much. We were talking about symbiosis, the machine, the human symbiosis. We were saying how we could augment the performance uh, of a human being if technology truly supported that person and augmented the capabilities, in this case, cognitive. So, oh, I'm sorry. This was, so this is how the technology evolved. This is the, the story is quite interesting. He almost adopted our students. And uh, the faculty, we became like his surrogate children. And the technology now moves. Uh, this is where it's stabilized, and this is what is currently also in the market, though new versions exist. Uh, uh, this is the one, actually. What we do is we took that concept of shining light. These are the uh, four LEDs in this case, but you can do it with laser. You will see a laser version also uh, for a handheld device. And these are the detectors. And basically, you could map what you're uh, seeing in the brain uh, to the oxygenation of the blood when a nervous tissue uh, uh, acts, uh, functions, it needs the ox oxygen. So you can very easily see oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin. Those of you who are familiar with functional MRI, you know that this is what the uh, deoxyhemoglobin signal. We can see also oxyhemoglobin. We cannot go as deep, but it's a comparable technology. But it is, it is obviously wearable. 
Now, these are the new versions out there. Uh, this version hopefully will be coming soon. You will be broadcasting from your brain and say, uh, you will be all wearing what uh, this um, uh, technology uh, you know, uh, gives you. And uh, it would be very easy for me uh, because we have also recently published and it became very, very popular that when I'm speaking and you're listening, our uh, signals, which you, I will show you a little bit, get, get synchronized. So we understand each other. This is, in a way, brain-to-brain -brain communication of a very interesting kind. And for that, you really need non-intrusiveness uh, of the technology. So let's look a little bit at the physiology of this thing. Um, I know that you are not, um, uh, in um, large part, interested. But we must understand the basic fundamental principles in order to be able to design any technology. This is our nervous tissue, and this is one of our neural cells, and it's, it is activated because I'm maybe paying attention to what is around me, or you're paying attention to me, or you're forming sh uh, memories, probably uh, working memories as you're listening. So the uh, red blood cells, oxygenated uh, blood cells, which we call oxyhemoglobin, and now are going to give up their oxygen, and what will continue will be deoxyhemoglobin, the blue blood, basically. And that we connect to not only uh, this, the signal that we get from oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, we can connect it to brain activity. We can also, as I will show you the equation, connect it to brain physiology. But let's continue because this is not a, a point of this uh, talk. Uh, also, the physical principles. The physical principles are such that there is a window, and maybe I go to that immediately, there is an optical window, 700 to 900 nanometers, when light crosses our skin, our, uh, the, um, uh, the skull, and then hits the surface of our cortex, and our brain is an amazingly well-designed organ uh, it is fed, all the, uh, the um, um, cognitive activity happens especially in the frontal uh, part of the brain, but the whole brain actually is very well mapped. You know exactly what you're doing. If you're doing a movement right now, if I'm recording from here, I will know exactly what you're doing. So this window is very important where water absorption is very low, so we can solve equations uh, using, in this case, two wavelengths, but we also use for other problems to solve uh, other wavelengths also. And we capture this oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin signal and cortical activi activation becomes accessible to us, especially if you're wearing this technology. So, but there's a catch. Uh, scientists, mostly physicists, biophysicists who are working on, or neuroscientists, psychologists, all those people in our lives, they work with this technology, but they are not, they are not equipped like we are, as, and especially because this is my specialty and my uh, team is uh, quite uh, advanced in that, is digital signal processing. Digital signal processing allows us to glean very faint signals in amazing amount of noise, because everywhere there is uh, um, light, and we want the person who is uh, being monitored with this technology to be out there in natural in my, uh, settings. So the, the, this is where what made our team actually, because there are various teams all over the world working on this, we all come together because we have a joint society also to push this frontier, uh, but we always are a bit ahead of them because of our ability to do good signal processing and good engineering. So what happened eventually when you're working on a frontier topic of this kind and you have a mission of the kind that we have, which is quite ambitious, what happens is that you become almost what now NSF started calling convergent team, meaning anybody that brings value comes to the place because this place has a unique purpose, a unique facility where very different people, and now I could start uh, uh, enumerating all the various disciplines that work with us, including psychiatrists, including nurses, including uh, obviously all kinds of psychologists, movement scientists, 
uh, rehabilitation specialists, so on and so forth, in, from life sciences, of course, neuroscience is always at the center of everything, but also all uh, uh, colors and all types of engineering and uh, uh, device design and uh, oftentimes people from materials because obviously these are wearable stuff so it has to work with you and you should not sweat and all of these uh, other considerations. So we all come together to just study brain function and brain injury. This is the easier path uh, because when we solve the mathematics uh, uh, co uh, cognitive signals are harder than uh, to solve for, uh, a, um, uh, for uh, the blood pooling, for instance. This, this technology that I show here is one of the versions of a technology where the same platform, which I enlighten again, but the way we solve the equation, we can see the uh, blood pooling, the, what we call hematoma, kanama, being kanama. Uh, and uh, the, the facility is not a big place. Uh, the core people who live there and who are recycled for various applications um, use, obviously, a variety of uh, uh, facilities. The know-how that exists here for experimental protocol design is truly extensive. And this is why we co call this cognitive neuroengineering quantitative experimental research. And we did not call it an institute, a center, or anything, laboratory, whatever. We called it a collaborator. And everybody, and we have, op and as I will have at the end, it's open invitation. You can be from any institution, any, from any country, from any discipline. You could be lawyer, business uh, people, investor, whomever. We absolutely have our arms open. And we're almost always in some group um, working. And this O is not a typo. It's what I call zero degree of separation, meaning when we need to solve a problem of some kind, or we have an idea that we would like to focus on, we should be uh, uh, in one step accessing that person who is now going to join us and we will be able to move forward. Uh, obviously, when you create a facility of this kind with a small core team, but branching out to all these various disciplines where domain experts need the technology, the, that you are developing. So what you do is you enable them. I'm going to, uh, later on, I will go to health application, uh, but I'm going to enumerate a little bit uh, the various applications where we had to, we were basically recruited to work on. As you saw, DARPA recruited us to create this uh, um, human, especially brain and technology loop. Now there are many, many groups who, for instance, no, I'm sorry. Uh, from, for instance, this is Federal Aviation Agency. They come, they come to us and say, we really need objective measures of cognitive workload of our pilots or of our air traffic controllers or of our unmanned system operators. And we end up working with various different institutions, di different uh, uh, groups that have very interesting domain expertise that eventually gets added to our core team of R&D uh, types and engineering types with all those other scientists that work with us. So, for instance, this project actually is finally starting in Turkey. When we uh, started pushing this technology, one of the first places we descended, of course, was uh, Middle East Technical University because some postdocs had worked with us and Bilisel uh, Bilimler Cognitive Sciences uh, group in the Information Institute. And uh, the first paper I discovered the other day was in 2008. Uh, this was about uh, how to personalize uh, the simulators for, um, in, in that case, for pilots. So this, this, is now, this has now become through um, SSM uh, a program called Genius. And it's in the process. It took maybe 10 years, but eventually it happened. And uh, this is, of course, something that we do a lot with the uh, US, especially Air Force, and uh, various companies. Neuroergonomics is a, is a word that we cornered. Uh, we did our first conference in, um, in Paris uh, in October, uh, the year before last. And now it's going to be in Philadelphia, and I will uh, put up for those who may be interested. There are quite a few colleagues participating uh, from uh, coming from Turkey. What this is, is it's brain in natural environments. 
and brain-in-the-loop systems. This is what also we call the natural and artificial intelligence loop. Um, gaming um, developers are always uh, very interested in what we are doing and there are some very nice beginnings where your brain signal is becoming part of the uh, uh, game, but this game could be for a serious purpose such as an attention deficit child's need for uh, practice with this interactive game. Neurofeedback is another area that's growing very fast uh, because we can connect the information that we're collecting from the brain into the loop of applications such as Lumosity. This is brain game type of stuff and you see your brain and you can actually, uh, we have also some research on that one, you can literally exercise your brain and especially for those of us who are getting old, I am absolutely uh, convinced that that's how I'm going to mitigate the cognitive decline. Actually, we have some major projects working on that area too. More recently, in the US and hopefully everywhere else, it's the machines, it's the, uh, um, it's the humans, but it's not just one machine, one human, it's many of them, swarm, uh, unmanned systems, men systems or human system, whatever, but the performance of live and physical systems. This is happening now with American Air Force uh, and Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin several years ago, like many others, such as Honeywell and all of them, have created the neuroscience departments. We tried to build one in, um, with uh, Havelsan, but it didn't quite succeed. Uh, there is a wonderful operation in Middle East Technical University, MOTSIM, Modelle Mesimilation Merkezi, and that is where actually uh, perhaps we could also engage in these futuristic uh, systems because you have to practice these systems in order to be able to understand how you're supposed to design the entire operation and more so how to eventually come up with the standards and so on and so forth. I will not go into the details like this but it's a very natural that neural learning become part of also another frontier. Uh, there is uh, all these uh, various uh, uh, learning uh, uh, topics where you can truly see the brain learning and you can truly also help the disabilities. In our case we've done a lot of work especially with Israel, uh, Haifa University actually on dyslexia and uh, turned out to be very very productive. Uh, obviously if those children who cannot calculate or those who have attention deficit or autism and I told you a little bit about uh, speaker synchronization. I must check my time. Um, obviously, our heart is always in life-saving solutions. So whatever we do in, the, uh, in other sectors, it could be automotive aviation or marketing or uh, uh, business decisions, because this is, these are the groups that come to us a lot more than uh, the health uh, care yet. But we are determined to obviously move <coughs> in the area of traumatic brain injury. I will show you some of the innovations coming out of us. Right now we came from China because Chinese uh, um, business and investment groups discovered what we were doing. They have been op apparently observing us for four or five years and finally they were able to uh, bring us, though I have been very active in China, but my colleagues, this one is Kurtul Shizetolo, uh, to China to see if this R&D where anesthesia automation, anesthesia dosing automation can be done so that they don't need anesthesiologists in, in obviously outpatient and so on and so forth. So this is what the, uh, a lot of the uh, conversations were uh, happening and we are trying to see if this conquer could be also extended to other parts of the world where we can be uh, productive and push these uh, outcomes. Uh, neurodegenerative disease is an obvious thing because quality of life of these people, uh, though they have a functioning brain, they can see and they can hear is lacking, so you can connect them to the world. Uh, again, very interesting applications. Pediatric monitoring is a place where there's an enormous amount of unmet need and mental health has hardly any, any. It's such an underdeveloped um, sector of health it does not have any objective, any 
quantitative measures for, uh, enab uh, for enabling the caregivers to diagnose and also to monitor the treatment regimen. So uh, this also is happening in China. We tried everywhere. We tried in Turkey, we tried in US, we couldn't succeed, but in China, uh, especially the university, one of the universities that we are very uh, integrated with joint P uh, PhD programs, uh, Shanghai Jatong University has a mental health hospital where R&D teams are embedded in the life of the uh, mental uh, patients. And so uh, there are a lot of things, but maybe I should mention suicide. There's a huge big epidemic in US, especially uh, teenage suicide. So they come to us because there are signs that we can very early detect from the way they uh, uh, function when you're presenting them with some um, uh, tasks. Uh, this one was one of the most recent ones when groups of uh, MDs and nurses came to us because when a mother, and a quite a high percentage of mothers go into depression after giving birth, and when we mothers, uh, we are interacting with the babies, the baby's brain connectivity depends on that mother-child interaction. And when that interrupt, uh, interaction inter is interrupted, uh, brain development uh, is retarded. So this is a huge big issue also. Many of us live outside this world, but when they come to our lab and say, please help us, in order for us to see if the drugs we give, uh, anti-depression drugs that we give to the mothers, are helping them communicate better, and so on and so forth. Uh, cognitive aging is what I mentioned. We have a huge, big program uh, with Albert Einstein Medical School in New York. Uh, th this is the largest R&D center for geriat geriatric studies, and uh, this is uh, where we have enabled them uh, to, uh, to truly work on uh, mitigating uh, cognitive de decline, and I'm sort of getting ready to be one of their subjects eventually. But in any case, so th the new frontiers are emerging. The whole pharmaceutical industry is changing in an hum amazing way because finally we are capable of using various uh, energy modalities such as magnetic, such as uh, ultrasound, focused ultrasound, low, low intensity focused ultrasound especially, and electrical activity to affect change in the brain so that we do not drug them. So these are what we call, especially our interest area is in electroceutical. Already you probably hear those who have depression who are, who is, that is not curable from, uh, by other means end up with transcranial magnetic stimulation. And that is a clinical product already, FDA approved and so on and so forth. There are also transcranial direct current stimulation. These are uh, technologies that are out there. What we're capable of is close the loop so that we can dose the appropriate amount of electricity into the brain so we do not cause side effects. And uh, this uh, electroceutical world is going to take off and go places. These are places where countries like Turkey, like China, developing yet, but also at the same place as all the developed countries are. So there is absolutely no reason if we put the right teams together to be able to contribute to humanity's health from any developing country. Because right now, everything that we are doing is enabled by the digital transformation to which my life was dedicated, actually. Uh, to, so when we digitize, we become very um, uh, um, powerful. Uh, in bringing solutions. So this is what we co uh, truly consider a frontier for us and because we live in that region, that makes obviously a lot of sense. So now let's sort of look at the two spin-offs of this operation uh, that I have been part of and um, I have learned an awful lot from and I have been very humbled by also. Uh, especially I mention it to those who know me when finally I accepted to be on the board of this company, I, I was put, uh, I was elected to be chairwoman of the board, and what happened? And this is something that I keep repeating. With my academic mind, and especially my academic ego, the first few years that this company stayed as an R&D company until the products started coming out, all the decision I was making was, 100% wrong. Now that is a very hard thing to accept 
by a professor. So this taming of your ego becomes a major issue. So that's why I will be discussing this big program that we have been a leader in the US and we are trying to also hopefully get it off the ground in, in Turkey, hopefully with your help. This is a true uh, challenge to have this academic culture with this almost for an academic humiliating culture, the business, because everything is profit. None of you academics are thinking profit. And I learned to think about profit, not the profit I would make, the profit that the lawyers we work with make and the people who invest into us make. The government don't, don't, doesn't make profit, university doesn't make profit, it's the lawyers and the business people who are investing into us or who are managing us that make the profit. But that profit, this profit motive that I used to always demean and dismiss is the bloodline of capitalism. If you do not have profit, the system doesn't complete, the patient doesn't get the benefit of your knowledge. That discovery to me was the reason why I went to class, sat in the back, became, became part of workshops, taught myself how to, how, how is this world working? What are those companies, the startups that are happening? But in any case, so this technology that you saw, which is shining light, it's a laser light, shine light and see that the brain is bleeding on site and not only do you see where it's, uh, that it's bleeding, you know where it's bleeding uh, so that this person, if uh, is, a, is in a rural area, a remote area, can be actually uh, um, attended to by drilling a hole, wherever that thing is, which is not a hard thing, and suck the blood out and save, which happened in Africa when a missionary doctor, uh, we must have given him a technology, saved lives and there are interesting videos on that company. We are now in 70 countries uh, with this technology. And the interesting thing that we're learning is that it's not all everything is about business, it's also a change of culture issue because you are first in kind, you're bringing something that nobody's seen before. So there is this standard of care thing. Will the MDs, will the nurses, will the healthcare professionals, will the soldiers who care for um, uh, wounded soldiers, will they accept this technology? So will it become part of their standard operating procedure? So that, uh, for instance, what happened in Poland, for instance, the pediatric pediatricians get to get, got together, the neuropediatric types, got together, worked with the uh, government, turned it into, in Poland, into pediatric standard of care. So all pediatric facilities in Poland now has to have it because anybody can use this technology. You do not need professionals or you don't need hospitals. It could be a pediatric facility where there's a daycare or, or something of the sort. As long as somebody knows, uh, learns how to use it, which is not complicated, um, it can happen. Now it's, uh, it has also become almost unbeknownst to us is by people who purchase this thing and who see its potential, it has become standard of uh, um, uh, care in sports. So the uh, soccer games that will be played in Russia, all the stadiums will be equipped with our technology and you will see referees using it, God forbid, if there is, a, uh, uh, if there is an accident. There's a, uh, obviously in the pipeline are uh, technologies, in this one is a multi-function version of this thing where we are adding a number of uh, new sensors. Uh, by the way, the R&D team that is supporting this whole uh, operation, not only this one but also brain function is all Turkish, uh, just so you know. Uh, when uh, the Chinese investors finally uh, decided they will go with it, uh, the CEO of the company apparently told them we have an issue uh, because our R&D team is Turkish and they said absolutely fine with us and that is, this is why they, would, they really would like us to have also extensions to, uh, uh, to their country. Operational environments, especially you would think that this is only a military situation, this is also in disaster care, this is also uh, um, uh, times of uh, and places, remote places in the country, like for instance if you were to think of Turkey, it would be the eastern and southeastern part where access to medical care for a trauma patient 
from a, uh, especially someone who's having a hemorrhagic shock, uh, is not accessible, uh, available. But it can be uh, uh, av uh, made uh, um, um, available to to those people. Now, this one is the uh, the one that I showed earlier. This is one of its later versions. Uh, this company that's distributing it uh, is deploying it uh, also from our lab, basically, in health, in aviation, in education and business. This is the hottest topic at this moment, and we participate. We now learned with the first technology when it was going food and drug through Food and th Drug Administration, they couldn't regulate it because there were no standards. So we, the developers, had to work on the standards. So now we work with IEEE to anticipate the innovations that are coming and we are part of the neurotechnology subgroup uh, so that the standards would be available because when you have the standards of operation, others can also build it and make it available. Now, in the last 10 minutes or so, I, I would like to come to the pathway. How, how come uh, many laboratories that are much better endowed, smarter than us, maybe even more diverse and more interdisciplinary than us, are not able to move their technologies out there. It's partially because, because we have become, uh, in Turkish, alçak gönüllü, because we have accepted that others know things better than we do, because we have welcomed the lawyers, even we like our lawyers, which is a very hard thing to do, sorry Elif, but the, because lawyers will always stop you from doing this next thing. They will say this is against this, this is this, there is an ethical issue, and so on and so forth, which is great, but it's hard for us who are pushing a frontier to accept this. But in any case, the, 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 the thing that the path actually is populated by others, not those of us who come with the idea. Those of us with the idea are literally in this cloud before even you enter the first stage before the product design, before the product development, before the early stage funding from maybe COSCEP or uh, TATEDEP or something like that. This is before. Everything is before. Because we're creating value through thesis degrees because academic value is that. Academic value is, has nothing to do with commercial value. In any case, when you look into more details of this, if you take this startup part of this, this is not even yet industry, what needs to happen in that stage, the university is pretty much like here, early clinical trials maybe, a little bit of a business strategy maybe. This is proof of concept and pre-business proof of concept because what you have to do now as a startup is the commercial risk reduction through, is the technology ready, am I intellectual property wise <coughs> secure to move forward, what, what, am I infringing on others, are the regulatory matters uh, surmountable, because regulatory pathway is very demanding when you're first in kind, when you develop something completely new. Is it manufacturable, is it marketable, can I make it at a price that the market will bear, is it investable, how am I going to handle liabilities if I'm missing a brain trauma case and uh, the person dies, so on and so forth, and more so to become not only part of existing standards, but become developers of standards. Take that responsibility and do it. So later on, industry and university have nothing to do with each other, but the past always will return to you because there will be new generation uh, uh, devices or technologies to be developed. So in a way, our awareness as academics of this world out there makes us a lot more sensitive to this risk reduction. So this is why sometimes, this is like almost 10, 15 year old slide probably. This, I, I have many of them also in Turkish because I, when, when I realized what needed to happen is that I put it in a graphical form. Universities, hospital, research hospitals and so on and so forth are filled with good ideas. And there's great funding from Tubitak and all of them. Uh, and uh, even uh, other agencies, even cor corporate um, philanthropy. Here, once you are in industry, obviously, again, uh, small business innovation uh, grant type of stuff, uh, science and technology innovation research we call it. There are in every country some versions of them or even private foundation. But what is not well funded is that risk reduction, risk abatement place where 
The technology proof of concept is not the issue, it's the business proof of concept. If we do not have among us those who can assess the market, the marketability, the commercial viability, the, our freedom to operate and to make the next move, and if we will not be able to go through um, approvals through, uh, through the regulatory system, and we will, if we will not be reimbursed because the uh, the uh, third payers, the insurance companies, the Sicorta has not accepted our uh, technology as one of those to be uh, supported. So th this is the, uh, basically the, uh, the general uh, sort of um, the general uh, makeup of, the, of that transition. Now, this is again very old, pretty much at the same time, also there's Turkish versions of this. We at university create beautiful value, academic value. This is what happens at UNAM, at Bilkent, at Middle East Technology, at Hajjet, everywhere. What we do is basically we engage in very high risk stuff. Risk in this case is infinite. And that's why there's zero commercial value. But we create intellectual property, we maybe protected it. This is all investment. Obviously we publish, obviously thesis happen, obviously students graduate. That's great value. But the, there's also another value for society, which is something I know is now going to go and help save schizophrenic for one reason or another. So that, for that, you have to get truly lucky that people who work with you, prototypers, engineers, those who are helping you from the business world uh, with the business proof of concept, those nurses and MDs who are helping you with preclinicals, the clinical prototypes and so on and so forth, finally you cross this amazing what we what in us the cliche is value of death you fall into it nothing comes out say so in in turkey this is exactly our reality we have great actually uh, our colleague from um, um, industry ministry uh, was calling it graveyard of startups graveyard of prototypes this is exactly what needs to be crossed so that an work with all these people, especially, again, lawyers and those who typically don't exist in academic life. Uh, the, the technology transfer offices, in a way, help, but they are still in the bubble, or very early, uh, in the way it was designed, actually. So what our solution was, and what some of the models that I will quickly mention uh, uh, are about, is to bring that world, this different world, these different cultures, into us so that from be the beginning, as we are developing academic value, the risk abatement happens in our environment through some mechanisms that actually I have become very familiar of, especially we have been the leaders of this program, which the, I will quickly go, I had put the slides for you, but I will skip them because I don't have the time. Later on we can sit and look at them, but look at these models. This is National Science Foundation, equivalent of Tupitak, created this innovation core model, which is great. They pay for the faculty and the students come out of the university, go on site, go into industry, go into the business world, the lawyers, offices and stuff like that. They reach out to find out where is the need, because they are all the commercialization stakeholders. The end users and the industry pretty much get to be accessed by these people. Great program. Uh, the founder of it is Errol Akkalic, Arkalic, excuse me, another Turk, interestingly, uh, for Americans who are among us. Uh, why Turks do these things? We don't know. But in any case, so this model, uh, where I can claim no Turkish contribution, is from Stanford, Stanford D School, and this is totally the opposite of this. The biodesign program is an amazing program now. It's replicated through design thinking in a variety of uh, um, universities. Northwestern is fantastic, Minnesota, fantastic. In this case, the industry comes in, uh, the, the model that we pretty much used in our environment. This one is a very, very interesting model that fuses this chaotic academic culture by bringing business discipline, embedding it in it, but not affected the academic chaos, because we need academic chaos for creativity. So this is embedding professionals among us. Academics become enabled by these professionals who live with them, understand them, and make them basically become serial innovators. When 
the professionals make sure that serial entrepreneurs are able to collect the low-hanging fruits and do great businesses on them. So let's sort of look at this. This, is, this started in 2005 after uh, Kultur um, Corp's uh, founder passed away, actually sold the company to Beckman and passed away. He was an amazing engineer and innovator and visionary, and he believed that science serves humanity, and he also believed that uh, uh, the diversity of world cultures will be what saved humanity. Uh, saved humanity. He was, uh, sick. During the Second World War, he was, he was sent to China, actually. He went all, over, all around the world. Very interesting man, and he, wherever in the world, address unmet need he wanted. So he, the business people from his or organization created this foundation. 80 universities competed in this very demanding competition. T uh, 10 of us ended up working for five years developing, evolving the methodologies. Because as you can see, uh, we are uh, ten, ten, among 10 universities. Our university is the tiniest, is the less, least developed university. Next to us, we have Stanford, we have Michigan. These are billion dollar operation R&D. We are only 100 million uh, range, and so on and so forth. But when you believe in, uh, in um, not only creating a system, a systematic for, that is appropriate for your own reality, then everything happens. Now I will start skipping. I, had, I, I will st stop um, speaking. If you're interested, you can really go and study what are the details of this thing. Very amazing, bringing the world actually into our lives. This is the oversight committees. These are how we measure. But more importantly, what happened? The first six years of operation, uh, because we were funded in 2006 after that uh, competition, Five years we worked together, this is the end of it. And at that time, we were the five schools, the, I think six schools now, uh, Stanford, Duke, Michigan, University of Virginia, and our school, which is like in the relationship to, if we were to uh, make an analogy with com countries, it would be United States and Turkey, kind of, Stanford and Drexel. But in any case, we were able to demonstrate professionally audited commercial outcomes that surpassed Stanford that is in Silicon Valley. You can do this. It's very possible. The only thing is to sort of take a deep breath and say, what is it that I am supposed to do, accepting my own reality, my own capabilities, my own ecosystem, and the gaps in my ecosystem? What is it that I'm going to do in order to move a wonderful solution to the end user. In this case, I'd like to very quickly say, because uh, I, there might be some colleagues among us who are from Silicon Valley or have uh, to understand what Silicon Valley does. In this case, this foundation, well, by establishing this amazing um, system, systematic, I should say, uh, um, um, uh, specialized to various universities. So what we would do twice a year, we would get together where the foundation is, which is uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale, and we would share the best practices. Our practices to um, affect outcome would be very different from Stanford because they are in Silicon Valley, very different from University of Virginia because it is uh, where it is and location. It would be very different from University of Michigan, but in principles, we would absolutely do the same thing. But the way we operated, the way we measured, the way we absolutely uh, attended to uh, an issue was different. So we learned an awful lot from us. So it ended up that at that time, now I will give you other figures, but because I was just at the Investment Forum of Culture in Raleigh, North Carolina, a few months ago, so they had spent only $56 million, something NIH couldn't do, something NSF couldn't do, because NIH tried many, many times now, culture um, um, approach actually is integrated into the SBIR programs, uh, also at NIH, for instance, and NSF also interact very nicely. But they had, what had happened is that <coughs> 250 or so in those 10 <coughs> schools, projects had been supported, there was, there was uh, venture capital funding, risk investment uh, of, um, um, on 52 projects, and this much risk investment, angel and venture investment, or corporate investment, had gone into this, giving a multiplier of 10. This is not, 
this is not feasible or possible in any other way than if you truly bring the world and manage that internally in that very chaotic culture with that very disciplined, bottom line oriented business culture in, in, a, uh, in a society. So I think there is a way out for Turkey, for instance. It's almost obvious after now, because this was 2005, so it's almost 13, 14 years right now. And all the learning and all the uh, basically, <laughs> like I said before, humiliation, hopefully is worth it, that we can create a program in Turkey that would truly leverage the wonderful ideas that our faculty and our researchers had. So uh, I'd like to end here uh, by thanking you. This was a very roundabout and confusing talk maybe, but hopefully you you accept our invitation. Those of you who are interested in the brain and the uh, in natural environment, please come to this uh, conference. It's going to be in Philadelphia. If you're interested, you can start uh, visiting Kultur Drexel Translation and Shared Partnership Program, or you can uh, visit all the other, now we are 14 schools. And certainly, in my case, I use this uh, platform to enable uh, in China especially at this moment. There are some other countries too. We learned an awful lot from Israel actually, but Israel obviously is very advanced in this. Uh, this is where I was also putting some time learning basically, but uh, we uh, would like to have this global innovation partnerships established all over the world. And for me, that is the only way, only path to peace and prosperity. So thank you so much. Now, thank you very much, uh, Professor Onaral. We are running a little bit short on time. Uh, I can see that you are uh, impatient for the lunch. So maybe we can take the questions, maybe just one question, and then uh, Professor Onaral is with us during the day. So if you have any questions, I will just uh, kindly ask you to meet her afterwards. Several times you use the concept of interdisciplinarity. Yes. It's all unity. I worked a lot on transdisciplinary mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. What you are doing is completely from the academic uh, point of view, mm -hmm. from the uh, uh, science methodology point of view, is transdisciplinary. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're, we're merging, it's basically. It's yeah. not epistemology. Yeah. No, no, no. There's a huge difference. In the first one, it's a synthesis. In the second one, you target the problem. And Joint forces, yes, yes. Yeah. Joint forces, yes. The second one, you used, I mean, you said that academia have nothing, uh, academia have nothing with commercial value. That's very important. Uh, yeah, uh, and also everything is profit. Well, here I will make a comment that I wrote several times on this issue. If we are living in, uh, I taught in this university, PhD course on world dynamics. When you look at the world dynamics, world dynamics is driven by the power and power of mind. So what you are doing is remarkable, but we have to keep in our mind and we have to endogenize this dynamics of world driven by power and power of mind. Otherwise, we can I couldn't understand the world driven. Driven by power. By what? Power. power. Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Power and power of money. Yeah, of course. Uh, capitalism. Yes. This is what I understood after 50 yes. years. But yes. We need mm -hmm. to Obviously, we cannot discuss this philosophical because it's a very important philosophical issue here. Because truly, if uh, in we join forces from any discipline, any culture, any institution, any country, we can change the world truly to serve 
the underserved and the underprivileged, and this is how my school started, basically. These are all technologies that are competing with the, the major healthcare industry that's entrenched itself and imposes itself on Turkey, on China, and everywhere in Africa, so on and so forth. So these are solutions. This is, an, for instance, this technology is the equivalent of functional MRI, actually. So the fact that it is bringing this uh, solution to uh, a very low cost, accessible to millions kind of a thing is, in a, is a quite message that truly I believe in what you're saying. But we have to accept the reality that the way the healthcare driven by the West, especially North America and uh, Europe has focused not on serving the large numbers, but serving basically those who can afford it. Uh, so that's why in the US, for instance, we have a huge big issue with healthcare. And we are very sad because we have the best healthcare, but we cannot have uh, everybody access to the same, um, same um, service. You see, so there, is, there are so many undercurrents, and when I'd like to speak with you more and discuss this, because the guiding light could be that the long um, road, but current reality must modulate what we do so that we can make small steps to make sure that eventually we transform healthcare. We're in the midst, midst of transformation of the healthcare, and all the giants, Medtronic's and Philips and G's, are resisting. I hope you know that. So that is, the, the, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thanks. So, much. Uh, so just a few remarks. The lunch is being served at the, just next to the pool at the center of the campus. So when you leave the building, take a right and it will be about 50 meters away. And poster uh, presentations will be from 1.30 to 2 p.m. We'll be back at 2 p.m. in this room again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.